Well, a very warm welcome to everyone to what for us is a very special occasion this afternoon. Uh, this is the first lecture of its kind in Scottish church history, and uh, we are so encouraged that you've decided to come uh, to join us today along with students and staff all here at Edinburgh Theological Seminary. It's great to see you, and uh, I hope that you feel at home with us. Uh, we're delighted this afternoon uh, to welcome us our uh, guest lecturer, Dr. Ian Hamilton. Uh, Dr. Hamilton uh, studied, first of all, economic history at Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Then he went on to uh, study uh, divinity at uh, New College next door. And uh, his doctorate uh, is from Greenville Presbyterian Seminary. He's been uh, a pastor in Cambridge for the last 17 years. And uh, that is until this year where he intends to finish his time there. Uh, he's going to speak to us this afternoon on Samuel Rutherford, a man of extremes. And uh, the idea, of course, uh, behind uh, the lecture is to promote uh, our course in uh, the, the Master of Theology course in Scottish Church History and <coughs> Theology, or taught course. And uh, if you or if you, anyone you know would like or is interested in studying at this course then be very welcome to do so and uh, feel free to find out more information uh, about it by uh, contacting our secretary. Uh, can I, without further ado, uh, welcome Dr Hamilton. I'm going to lead in prayer uh, before uh, we ask him to speak to us. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for all that you have done here in Scotland. We give thanks, O oh Lord, that we have such a rich heritage and a rich history in which we can see the hand of God working remarkably, extraordinarily in changing the lives of men and women through the gospel. And we stand, O oh Lord, in important days, days when that same gospel we believe is the power of God to salvation. And we ask, Lord, that as we discover afresh the power of God in the past, we ask that it might inspire us to be men and women of God, walking close to you, filled with the Spirit, loving the Word and preaching and sharing that Word to a world that needs Christ. We ask, Lord, that you will bless Ian now as he comes to speak to us. We give thanks for him and we ask that you will uh, bless our fellowship together around what we are about to hear. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, it is a pleasure for me to be with you this afternoon, although somewhat daunting pleasure, looking at these stained glass luminaries behind me, but I see you have William Cunningham. Tell it not to Donald MacLeod, but William Cunningham's failure to really appreciate the glorious sacramental theology of John Calvin reduces him just a little in my estimation. But um, it is a privilege to be here, and I hope that together we will have our hearts warmed and perhaps even our minds expanded as we reflect for a short time on the life of Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford lived all of his life in political, social and societal, theological and ecclesiastical turbulence. His whole life and ministry were forged in a number of crucibles, the crucible of personal and familial suffering and for him the greater crucible of societal and ecclesiastical trauma. When Rutherford wrote, it is hard to keep Christ in view in a storm, he was writing from personal experience. Rutherford was an extraordinary and remarkable man by any accounts, and he described himself, as many of his contemporaries also described him, as a man of extremes. And those extremes were manifested internally and externally. 
Internally, Rutherford could be compellingly seraphic in his piety, but also at the, tame, at the same time densely scholastic. He was equally at home in the most philosophical, scholastic, Latinate theology as he was writing those seraphic letters that have so blessed the Christian church down through the years. Externally, Rutherford was no less a man of extremes. He could be passionate for peace in the church, which I hope we can see in a little time. But at the same time, he was vitriolic against those who could not and would not share his vision for the church. He was manifestly a man of extremes. This following comment by a contemporary highlights the esteem in which Rutherford was held by many of his contemporaries. I have known many great and good ministers in this church, but for such a piece of clay as Mr. Rutherford was, I never knew one in Scotland like him, to whom so many great gifts were given. For he seemed to be altogether taken up with everything good and excellent and useful. He seemed to be always praying, always preaching, always visiting the sick, always catechizing, always writing and studying. Many times I thought he would have flown out of the pulpit when he came to speak of Jesus Christ. Now, however, however much this is an idealised portrait of Rutherford, there is no doubting or denying, I think, he was one of Scotland's spiritual giants. The early decades of the 17th century were marked by the crown through compliant bishops seeking to bring the Reformed Church under its authority. The heady days of Presbyterian supremacy were increasingly a distant Memory. Men like Andrew Melville had first been imprisoned and then exiled by James. Rutherford then grew up in a church that was increasingly compromised and subject to the prelatic episcopal views of James. He was born into and ordained into a church he called Our Harlot Mother. But she was his harlot. And he wasn't going to give up on her. Rutherford was born most probably in 1600 in the village of Nisbet in Roxburghshire, the son of comfortably off parents. In 1617 he went to Edinburgh University where he excelled in Latin and Greek. Like Calvin before him, Rutherford makes almost no mention whatsoever of his conversion. There's a studied silence in all of his writings that clearly echoes Calvin's own almost complete silence about his conversion. There are probably only two references in all his writings to his conversion. In a letter to a Robert Stewart in 1637, he wrote, Ye have gotten a great advantage in the way of heaven. That ye have started to the gate in the morning. Like a fool as I was, I suffered my son to be high in the heaven and near afternoon before I ever took the gate to the end. That's 1637, looking back. The second reference, which I think enables us almost exactly to pin down at least the year of his conversion, is in a letter he wrote to Lady Kenure in 1636. That honour that I have prayed for these 16 years, with submission to my Lord's will, my kind Lord hath now bestowed upon me, even to suffer for my royal and princely King Jesus, and for his kingly crown, and the freedom of his kingdom, that his father hath given him. And so it's reasonable to assume, I think, that Rutherford was around 20 years of age when he was brought by the grace of God to saving faith 
in Jesus Christ. Rutherford's life in the early 1620s is shrouded in some mystery, as perhaps most of you know. He was dismissed from his university teaching position, and the City of Edinburgh council records mention a charge of fornication with a woman who later became his wife. Now there is a problem, I think, at this point. Shortly after this, Rutherford was inducted to the charge of Anne Roth by the Solway. And it seems incomprehensible that that could have happened if there had been such a moral blot on Rutherford's character. Now let me say this, I have no desire and no intention whatsoever to try and whitewash Rutherford. The Bible never does that with its heroes. There are times reading the Bible you almost want to say, Lord, did you have to tell me that in such graphic detail? Could you not have drawn a veil over that? The Bible is very upfront, embarrassingly upfront in exposing the sins and the weaknesses and the failings of the heroes of the faith. So I've got no desire whatsoever to try and whitewash Rutherford. But it seems strange, even to the point of it being almost incomprehensible, that if what the city council records write is true, that Rutherford could have been inducted so soon afterwards to this charge by Anne, or by, at Anne was by the Solway. In an unpublished paper that David Wright, late professor of ecclesiastical history at New College, gave to me, he has a little section where he argues that what was probably going on was deep-seated jealousy of Rutherford and animosity because of his refusal to conform to episcopal practices. Now whether David Wright was right, I don't know. But it makes sense, I think, of the fact that so soon after this charge is laid against him, and he's dismissed from the university, that he is appointed so soon afterwards to Anne Roth by the Solway. So in 1627, Rutherford is ordained and inducted. And the fact that he was inducted without giving engagement to the bishop, as he puts it, provides, I think, the first example of a principle that ran like a golden thread through Rutherford's life. Truth before consequences. Like Knox before him, Rutherford believed he was called to blow his master's trumpet. He would not indulge in ecclesiastical statesmanship. He was to be an unyielding servant of the Most High God. For the next ten years, Rutherford ministered happily and effectively in Anworth. During this time, his first wife died after a long and sore illness and his two children. Rutherford was no stranger to personal grief. He knew suffering firsthand. And the comfort his ministry and his letters especially brought to others was forged in the crucible of personal affliction. In 1635, Thomas Sidserf became Bishop of Galloway and Rutherford came under increasing pressure to conform to Episcopal authority. And on July 27, 1636, he was removed from his charge and exiled, not to Outer Mongolia, but to Aberdeen. He preached in Aberdeen uh, this past Sunday. Um, Aberdeen was a centre of episcopacy, and it was enough to remove Rutherford, so it was thought, away from the hotbed of the southwest and to the heartland of episcopacy. Rutherford was deeply affected by his removal from Manworth. He wrote, next to Christ, I had but one joy, the apple of the eye of my delight, to preach Christ my Lord 
and they have violently plucked that away from me. But while Rutherford's exile was a sore trial to him, it was used by God to bring unspeakable blessing and comfort to multitudes because during the next near two years of his exile, Rutherford wrote 220 of his 365 extant letters. So if Satan intended to silence Rutherford by his exile, he found that God's sovereign wisdom turned for good what he intended for evil. Rutherford's letters have been described as the most remarkable series of devotional letters that the literature of the Reformed Church can show. And even Richard Baxter, who was one of Rutherford's most trenchant critics, could write, Hold off the Bible. Such a book of Mr. Rutherford's letters, the world never saw the like. Baxter thought the letters were just absolutely heavenly. Mind you, he also said that Rutherford's book on divine providence was the worst book he had ever read in his life. It's so full of Latinist, scholastic subtleties that you just get lost in the density of Rutherford's thinking. But what, of course, is remarkable is that Rutherford wrote his letters during a time of great personal trial. His letters flowed from a heart deeply wounded by the dark providences of God. And when he wrote in one of his letters, I find it most true that the greatest temptation out of hell is to live without temptation. If my waters could stand, they would rot. Faith is the better for the free air and the sharp winter storm in its face. Grace withereth without adversity. When Rutherford wrote that, he was describing his own experience. His trials were great, but the comforts and the consolations of the Lord Jesus Christ were greater. He wrote during this period, I never knew before that his love was such in such a measure. I have a fire within me. I defy all the devils in hell and all the prelates in Scotland to cast water on it. In 1638, the signing of the National Covenant heralded a new dawn for Christ's cause in Scotland. In June, Rutherford returns to Anworth. But less than a year later, the General Assembly appoints him to the strategic position of Professor of Divinity at St Andrews. My removal from my flock, he wrote, is so heavy to me that it maketh my life a burden to me. The Lord help and hold up sad clay. It was not surprising that Rutherford was one of the Scottish commissioners appointed in 1643 to the Westminster Assembly of Divines. It's hard, I think, to assess Rutherford's contribution to the Westminster Assembly. It depends who you read and what particular axes they had to grind. Robert Bailey, writing in 1644 to Robert Blair, said, Mr. Samuel, for the great parts God has given him, has any special acquaintance with the question in hand, church government, and is very necessary to be here. But Rutherford was a De Uri Divino Presbyterian. He was a divine right Presbyterian. And it was his views on church government that provoked Milton's famous uh, comment that new presbyter is but old priest writ large. Rutherford was uncompromising in his Presbyterianism. It was Presbyterianism or nothing. Why? Because that is what the Word of God teaches. So he believed. Robert Bailey wrote, No people, meaning the Westminster Assembly, had so much need of a presbytery. 
Amen. In 1644, Rutherford published his most enduringly notable controversial work, Lex Rex, variously translated, Law is King, Law and the Prince. It was a trenchant reply to the theory of the divine right of kings. If you want to smile, read the whole title. It's about 120 words in length. It's a magnificent Puritan title. The title it, it, it itself really is the index of what he's going to be dealing with. Rutherford and Lex Rex denied that a limitless sovereignty belonged to the king contending that the crown is bestowed by the voluntary consent of the people who are at liberty to resist the tyrant, not only by defensive wars, which is in the title, but also by preemptively struck wars. Caused a lot of controversy. But Lex Rex has had a remarkable remarkable effect on the development of Western civilization. Not so much in the 17th century, but remarkably and profoundly in the 18th century in the development of nation states. During Rutherford's time in London, and he stayed from 1643 to 47, never once went back to Scotland, unlike some of the other commissioners. Like all the other commissioners went back at some time or another. Rutherford stayed the whole four years. During that time, two children from his second marriage died. So in 1647, he returned once again to a childless home. And he wrote sorrowfully of this to another bereaved parent. I was in your condition. I had but two children, and both are dead since I came hither. The good husbandman may pluck his roses and gather in his lilies at midsummer, and for aught I dare say, in the beginning of the first summer month. 1649, Rutherford is appointed principal of the Theological College at St Andrews. And although Rutherford, and I would guess this would be true for most of us, is best known, perhaps almost only known, as a devotional writer, he was in fact also a highly speculative theologian. He was as much at home, and I really do mean that, he was as much at home with abstract philosophical theology as he was with homely piety. And Rutherford's more speculative thought is seen, for example, in his passionate espousal of supralapsarianism. Rutherford argued that God is not required by his holy nature to punish sin. He wrote, God punished sin by no necessity of nature. Nay, if he chose, he might leave it altogether unpunished. It's interesting, I think, to compare Rutherford's views and, less than a century later, Thomas Boston's views. Boston's view is highlighted in an extended discussion within the manner of modern divinity, first published in 1646 and again in 1648. The manner that liberated Boston and brought him into the liberty of the children of God, enabling him to preach the gospel with unfettered freedom. It sometimes, and perhaps even increasingly in these days, I've noticed of late, being asserted that Boston was tinged with the hypothetical universalism of Edward Fisher, who probably wrote the marrow, and of Tobias Crisp and others. Don't buy into that for a moment. But when you compare Rutherford with Boston, you find yourself reading Boston in more familiar territory. You're breathing more of the free air of the gospel. For example, in the Maru you have this discussion, asks Nomista, But sir, might not the Lord have pardoned Adam's sin without satisfaction? No! 
reply, replies Evangelista, for justice is essential in God, not arbitrary, essential in God. It is unjust to pardon sin without satisfaction. One of the saddest episodes in Rutherford's life began to surface around 1650 with the increasingly bitter and acrimonious controversy between the engagers, or the, revol uh, the resolutioners, and the protesters. Let me explain a little. In 1647, Charles I, who was ready to promise anything to anyone, and it's remarkable that any hard-headed Scot could have believed anything that came from the lips of Charles I. But in 1647, Charles entered into an engagement with the Earls of Lanark, Lauderdale and Loudoun on behalf of the Scottish Estates. In return for their support in his struggle against the English Parliament, Charles agreed to subscribe the Solemn League and Covenant and for a period of three years as a trial, to establish Presbyterianism in England. Now this effectively split the Covenanters into two parties. Those who were willing to engage with this and those who protested against it. The split as ever found godly men on both sides. I've just finished giving 20 hours of church history lectures uh, to a seminary in the USA and on the Scottish scene. And the thing that just struck me with every succeeding lecture was how at every split, division and disagreement there were good men on both sides. No united front because of this division was presented against Cromwell. And the church was totally ill-prepared for the accession of Charles II in 1660. And if there is a striking lesson in this sad episode in the life of the church in Scotland, it's simply this. A house divided against itself cannot stand. You may think in your generation it will. But look back and learn Rutherford could be and often was acerbically dogmatic, but at heart he longed for peace and unity. In a sermon preached before the English Parliament in June 1644, Rutherford revealed his heart's longing for peace and unity among all Christians. He wrote, Shall we kill and devour one another all day and lodge together in heaven at night? And can we say to one another in heaven, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? Shall there be any factions, any sides, either religions of Presbyterian and Independent in heaven, or nations of England and Scotland? And yet on earth must we be at daggers, at rents, at divisions? Are there two Christs because two nations? The accession of Charles in 1660, Charles II, meant that Rutherford's days were numbered. In 1661, he was deprived of his offices. Lex Rex was ordered to be burned. It was actually, I think, the last publicly burned book in the United Kingdom in 1683 or 4 in Oxford. He was charged with treason and deprived of his offices. Lord Burley said when he heard that Rutherford had been deprived of all his offices, said, ye have voted that honest man out of the college, but ye cannot vote him out of heaven. When Rutherford heard he was summoned to Edinburgh on charges of treason, he declared, I have got summons already before a superior judge and judicatory. And I behove to answer to my first sons, and ere your day come, I will be where few kings and great folks come. Rutherford had long waited for the day when he would see his kingly king. As he lay dying, he repeatedly called for a well-tuned harp, so 
He may have been an explosive saladist, but at least he thought we should sing the psalms with music. <laughs> On the last afternoon of his earthly life, he said, This night will close the door and fasten my anchor within the veil. His last recorded words were glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. He died on March 29, 1661, on the very day the infamous act Recissory was passed, and he went as he had long desired to Emmanuel's high and blessed land. Now that's the briefest of overviews of Rutherford's life. In the remaining time, I want to reflect with you a little on his devotional legacy, because without any doubt, it's Rutherford's devotional legacy almost exclusively, that is known in the Christian church, and not just within the Reformed church. And Rutherford's legacy to us in this area is immense. The spirituality and the piety of his letters, even at their most embarrassingly erotic, give the lie that Calvinism is natively cold, hard or clinical. If you ever meet anyone who claims to be a Calvinist who is cold, hard or clinical, either hit them on the head to bring them to their senses or confront them with the gross impiety of their declaration that they could conceivably be a Calvinist. Because whatever else Calvinism is, and you see this not just in Rutherford but in the whole Calvinistic Puritan tradition. Calvinism is warm, evangelical, and deeply affectional. Cold Calvinism is a theological oxymoron. And I want simply to highlight a few, not quite at random, but a few of the emphasis that you find littered throughout Rutherford's letters that should be principial hallmarks in the pastoral ministry of any man who dares to call himself reformed. And I would suggest, and more than suggest, that if any of these emphases are absent, such a man should not be left near the Christian ministry. Number one, Rutherford's letters are supremely Christocentric. My sorrow is that I cannot get Christ lifted off the dust in Scotland and set on high above all the skies and heaven of heavens. A letter to David Dixon, 1637. Give Christ your virgin love. You cannot put your love and heart into a better hand. Oh, if ye knew him and saw his beauty, your love, your liking, your heart, your desires would close with him and cleave to him, O oh, fair sun and fair moon and fair stars and fair flowers and fair roses and fair lilies and fair creatures, but O oh, ten thousand thousand times fairer Lord Jesus. Now none of us may be remotely able to rise to such seraphic heights, but surely the pulse beat of that resonates with you. He wrote another letter in 1637, Christ is a well of life, but who knoweth how deep it is to the bottom? And oh, what a fair one, what an only one, what an excellent, lovely, ravishing one is Jesus. Put the beauty of ten thousand thousand worlds of paradises in one, it would be less to that fair and dearest Jesus Christ. And in this I think he echoes his near contemporary John Owen. In volume 2 of Communion with God, when Owen comes to explicate the believer's communion with Christ, he speaks of Christ having communion with his people and his people with him in two ways. We have communion with Christ in his personal grace and we have communion with Christ in his purchased grace. And as he expounds the personal grace of Christ, he goes into this 
remarkable Christocentric exposition of the Song of Songs. Now you don't need to agree with all that regarding his understanding of how the song should be interpreted. He actually wrote the introduction to James Durham's commentary on the Song of Songs, which I, I, I think is just excellent. Owen and Rutherford had this in common. They were captivated, not just by the work of Christ, but by Christ. Oh, but Christ is heaven's wonder and earth's wonder. What marvel that his bride saith he is altogether lovely. Oh, pity forevermore that there should be such a one as Christ Jesus, so boundless, so bottomless, so incomparable in infinite excellency and sweetness, and so few to take him. If Benjamin Warfield is right in saying that Calvin was preeminently in the Reformation the theologian of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's great ministry is to glorify Christ. Then it should not surprise us that the most eminent Calvinists are those men and women who glory in the grace and loveliness of the Saviour. Whatever else people should be saying about your ministry and mine, they should be saying, he preaches Jesus Christ and loves him. Whatever else they say, hopefully they'll say more. But that at least should be the core that people leave with. He preaches Jesus Christ and does so out of love for him. Secondly, Rutherford's letters reveal a deep concern for the souls of his people. He didn't visit as assiduously as Thomas Boston did. Boston, I hope you've read you young men Boston's memoirs. If you haven't, read them. <laughs> They're just astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. And Rutherford, uh, Boston, visited just day in and day out, getting to know his people, ministering to them. And eventually, a congregation of 60 communicants became 700 after 20 odd years. Rutherford was also a visitor because he wanted to know his people and he saw his people in the light of eternity. And this passionate pastoral care for their eternal well-being is one of the marked characteristics of Puritan piety and I think of the reformed pastor. He wrote in a letter in 1637 of his people in Anworth, Thoughts of your soul depart not from me in my sleep. Oh, if I could buy your soul's salvation with any suffering whatsoever, that ye and I might meet with joy up in the rainbow when we shall stand before our church. My witness is above, your heaven would be two heavens to me, and your salvation two salvations. And isn't it that note that echoes the Lord Jesus Christ, who wept over Jerusalem, who holds out his arms all the day long, who through his servants pleads with sinners, a pleading Christ, he pleads with sinners. <coughs> Thirdly, Rutherford's letters reveal a deep sense of the sinfulness of sin. Like all truly biblically taught men, Rutherford was most conscious of his own sin. He was perpetually conscious of what he called my abominable vileness. He wrote, only my loathsome wretchedness and my wants have qualified me for Christ. That was a lovely note struck in the opening prayer of our devotions after lunch this afternoon. It deeply troubled Rutherford actually that someone so loathsome and vile as he should be admired as a master of the spiritual life. He was deeply embarrassed when people placed him on any kind of a pedestal. But the truth I think is that only those who have such a deep spirit in generated sense of their own <coughs> sinfulness before God can actually be effective ministers of the grace of Christ. 
to us. Only someone who in some measure knows their own heart before God can begin to begin to understand another's heart. And I think this is one of the attractions or part of the innate appeal of Rutherford's letters to succeeding generations because they recognise in Rutherford a man of like passions of themselves, someone who understands the heart of men and women. And I think it's true today that very few so-called masters or mistresses of the spiritual life speak about themselves as being an abominably vile or being loathsomely wretched or right as Rutherford did, ye are as near heaven as ye are far from yourself. But Rutherford was a man who had stood in the piercing light of who God is. And this deep sense of the sinfulness of sin is one of the enduringly attractive features because it's not gross, it's not self promoting. It's woven into um, a piety that is profoundly human. That's one of the great attractions of Rutherford, I think. Even when you read these letters that are seraphic beyond words and that sometimes are embarrassing beyond words, you never escape the humanity of Rutherford. And I think Rutherford can teach us this. I, I quote Thomas Goodwin rather than Rutherford because Goodwin puts it so briefly and simply. If thou wouldst know what sin is, go to Mount Calvary. You want to know what sin is? All the Puritans would say. You don't go to Sinai. You go to Calvary. And then you go to Sinai. Fourthly, I hurry on, briefly, Rutherford's letters are full of counsel to afflicted saints. Tender compassion and strong counsel are distinguishing features throughout his letters. Writing to Viscountess Kenmure, who was suffering spiritual depression, Rutherford wrote, Never believe that your tender-hearted Saviour, who knoweth the strength of your stomach, will mix that cup with one dram weight of poison. Drink then with the patience of the saints and the God of patience bless your medicine. In another letter he wrote, Our crosses are like puffs of wind to blow our ship home. They convey us to heaven's gate, but they cannot follow us into heaven. Rutherford wrote, these letters of counsel out of deep personal suffering and anguish. He wrote of his first wife, My wife is so tormented night and day that I have wondered why the Lord tarrieth so long. My life is bitter to me. It is hard to keep sight of God in a storm. Rutherford's piety could soar to the heights, but he knew firsthand the dark night of the soul. And his pastoral counsel was so cherished because it was forged. And people could sense it. You didn't need to tell them that. They could sense it in him as a person. It was forged in the crucible of his own familial experiences. And that's where pastoral ministry is so vital in the life of the church. That people have access into their pastor's life. Not unthinkingly, but that they can see even glimpse that what he is saying to them. It's not mere words that he has learned from the Bible or from books. But they are the overflow of a life that God has had deep dealings with. Fifthly, because our time is really gone. Rutherford's letters reflect a biblical realism and biblical spiritual sanity. He said, grace withereth without adversity. There's a kind of godly realism that 
runs through Rutherford's letters. And he wants his people to understand that no experience or string of experiences will lift you out of the struggle. We never cruise to glory, do we? That was the principal pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit, as Calvin puts it, by his ministry of replication, comes to take the principal pattern of Jesus Christ and to lay it upon the lives of his people. And uniquely, I think, and especially in the life of his ministers. True piety is patterned after the piety of the Lord Jesus, who is the prototypical man of faith. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. And that note of suffering is never far from Rutherford in his letters. It belongs to the warp and woof of authentic spirituality. Sons of God, if so be that we suffer with him. That suffering will take many different forms and guises. If I had time, I would have quoted to you Amy Carmichael's magnificent poem, Hast Thou No Scar? It's a wonderful poem. Hast Thou No Scar on hand or foot or side? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascended star. Hast Thou No Scar? But as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far, who has no wound, no scar? Well, his life was full of scars. He didn't promote them, he didn't display them, he would occasionally touch on them. But people knew from the pastoral empathy of his life that he was ministering out of a life that was coming ever more closely into union and communion with Jesus Christ. More could be said. His letters are full of eagerness for heaven. He talks constantly about the desire for the Lord Jesus to come. Oh sweet Jesus, take wide steps. O oh, fairest among sons of men, why stayest thou so long away? O oh, time, run, run, and hasten the marriage day. He once described himself as a man born down and hungry, waiting for the marriage and supper of the Lamb. Rutherford's piety was not even. He was self-consciously a man of extremes. He could be extraordinarily generous. He wrote, I judge that in England the Lord hath many names and a fair company that shall stand at the side of Christ. Now I think that's remarkably generous <laughs> of a Scot like Rutherford. That was in his preface to the survey of the spiritual Antichrist. But Rutherford was also a bitter controversialist. When Scott opposed Scott during the 1650s, Rutherford took up his pen vitriolically against godly men like his one-time dearest friend, David Dixon. And yet he could write to Lady Kenyon, We are now shouldering and casting down one another in the dark, and the godly are hidden from the godly. Too often good men could not see beyond themselves and their own convictions. Yet it is best Rutherford knew better. Samuel Rutherford, an extraordinary Christian, devotional writer par excellence, powerful preacher, passionate apologist, skilled dogmatician. But if you really want to know what made Rutherford tick, you need to see him through the lens of his dying words. Dear brethren, do all for him. Pray for Christ. Preach for Christ. Do all for Christ. Beware of men pleasing. The chief shepherd 
will shortly appear. Thank you. Dr. Hamilton, thank you so much for uh, coming here and thank you for packing so much detail and so much reflection into a mere 50 minutes. Uh, we've all appreciated that tremendously. One or two questions just for a couple of minutes. One or two questions. Does anyone uh, wish to pick, uh, pick up on anything that was said? Please don't be afraid to ask a question. Nigel. You mentioned the influence of Lex Rex on the development of nation states in the 18th century. Could you maybe expand on that a wee bit? Rex is um, a book uh, where Rutherford poses 44 questions and seeks to dismantle the whole notion that had prevailed in Western civilization and in Western Christendom from really the 4th century, the, the divine right of kings. And it said that Charles II, Charles I, sorry, when he read it, or part of it, don't read the whole thing, he said, this is unanswerable. <laughs> and the legacy was that it gave an intellectual, philosophical, and biblical framework to the development of nation states where the people, where the people, were the primary reality and not the king. The king was king because the people chose him to be. And so in the 18th century that was picked up by men like Montesquieu and taken into the American situation. And it converged with all different kinds of thoughts ranging from Thomas Paine and the rights of man uh, somewhat atheistical, but all of them, in a sense, um, challenging the accepted canons of century that, that certain men and women were privileged above and beyond others. And so when Robert Burns, whom I actually like, I, I had a, a window in my mass in New Mills with a poem that Burns had written to the minister's wife engraved with a diamond ring to fair Mrs. Laurie. But when Burns was writing things like um, see yon birkie cod a lord wha struts and stares and all that he's just a man, a man's a man for all that. He was picking up on that legacy that before Rutherford had actually surfaced a little in Knox, a little more in Melville and certainly in George Buchanan um, and Scotland then became, in the 18th century, one of the powerhouses of intellectual thought. Um, I can't say for the world, I don't know remotely that enough, but certainly in Western civilization. And the <clears throat> democratization, it's always using the word anachronistically, but you get the idea. The democratization of society owed so much to someone like Rutherford, who gave for the first time a tremendous philosophical clarity to truths that people felt were true but had never been able to articulate as well and as, as deeply and as profoundly as Rutherford did. John Locke and others who not agree with everything Rutherford wrote built on that. And there was a kind of momentum then throughout the 18th century into the 19th century. And that's why Lex Rex is still discussed and debated um, in universities. God willing, when I come and teach here, I hope we'll spend at least one lecture on Lex Rex and get the students looking at um, Rutherford's uh, political theory. Um, so, Montesquieu, America, it was feeding into those streams that really transformed the face of Western civilization. Looking at the time, yep. Bob. Ian, I thank you so much for your, for your address. Rutherford captured the beauty of Christ, 
the ugliness of sin. How could he then theologically suggest that sin did not necessitate punishment? Well, um, <laughs> read it and find out. Um, <laughs> that's a short way of saying, I, I don't understand, um, I don't understand um, mentally, I don't, have the, I don't have the mental capacity to grasp supralapsarianism. I think I can articulate it in measure, I think I can probably write about it. I can't understand because it seems to me that it's, it's, it's founded on the premise of a logic that is considered to be irrefutable and that doesn't take into account two things. One, the multifaceted complexity of God's intellective and emotional life and two, the fallenness of man. And so when I read the scriptures I, I see absolute divine sovereignty. God ordains all things according to the counsel of his own will. I read no less. You would not come to me that you might have life. Christ could not do many mighty works there because of unbelief. And to me, I'm left not to try and reconcile the two, but to bow before the multifacetedness and coherence, ultimate coherence of God's revelation in himself. But Rutherford with others, like before him, Bradwardine, um, they, they just ran with the idea that um, if God is God, then nothing can be contingent. And I don't understand how you get there. I think I can read what he's written and make some sense of it. Although I read something this past week that argued, this might be a more modern take on Rutherford, that his supralapsarianism was not as passionate as some have considered it to be. But that when you read say the trial and triumph of faith or some of his Queen sermons, you 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 think that this will seem a strange analogy. Tom Torrance, T. F. Torrance was my dogmatics tutor. He believed intellectually that the Bible was a fallible witness to the infallible word who is Christ. In practice he treated the Bible as God's infallible word. Now I think if I can take that analogy if you're going with me, to Rutherford, he's a supralapsarian, but you can't preach supralapsarianism. <laughs> Some people think you can, but you, you can't preach supralapsarianism. And I think that's why men like Rutherford and Gill and others, you read them and you think, what's the problem with their writings? But when they start to write philosophical theology, they can be supralapsarians. But you can't be a supralapsarian in real life. But that's an ignorant response to a very good question. Anyone else?